Let's bow our heads. Father, we come again tonight to study and to open up your word to have direction from you, to know where you want us to go and how you want us to live in our life. And we just pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to lead us and to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're talking about can the little horn change God's law? So we'll be looking at that this evening. And we're going to do a quiz first. And that first one is the little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. True or false? That's what these are. Okay. The little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. Number two. The little horn of Daniel 7 refers to a religious power that has mixed paganism and Christianity. Mixed paganism and Christianity. Number three, one of the most daring claims of the little horn power is that it thinks to change God's law. It thinks to change God's law. And then number four, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 refer to the same power. Refer to the same power. And number five, the number 666, and I say it because sometimes people just say 666, and it's okay to say that, but remember it's 666. It's just not three sixes. The number 666 refers to a literal number to be written on everybody's forehead in the last day. Do what? Yes, Delsey didn't say anything tonight. She's been very quiet. Number one. The little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. True or false? False, that's right. It has come, and it started to arise after what year? Do you remember that? I heard it. 457 B.C. I mean, A.D. Okay? All right. Number two. The little horn of Daniel 7 refers to a religious power that has mixed paganism and Christianity. True. All right. Number three. One of the most daring claims of the little horn power is that it thinks to change times and law. Okay. And number four. Number four says the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 refer to the same power. True. True. And then number five, the number 666 refers to a literal number to be written on everybody's forehead in the last days. Oh man, I was going to, I was going to try to do that to Doug, put it on his head. You know, I've actually been in stores and I've watched people when they get their grocery store receipt and it would come up $6.66 or six hundred and sixty six dollars and people say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And they go back there and buy a pack of gum <laughs> and they get to them and says, add that to it. And I just shake my head because people, the things that people think that they know in the word of God. So... All right, don't have to do that, do you? Don't have to worry about that. So today's lesson, we're talking about can the little horn literally change God's law? That's what we're talking about. But we have some things to kind of review a little bit. First of all, um, one of the things I want us to remember in the top of this lesson here, those three things are very important. I hope that you read them, but I'm going to go over them real quickly. But it says... The great controversy, my friends, we have a great controversy that's going on right now. 
And it has been going on. It's in the scriptures. It's been going on since the fall. Okay? Or actually before the fall. The fall in heaven. And uh, with, with Lucifer. So that great controversy theme. The theme of the battle uh, between good and evil. Going on between uh, the angels of God and the enemy of Satan. And um, so anyway, um, but anyway, that conflict is really about how people are going to worship. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? But one of the points I want you to remember is that Jesus is central in all prophecy. In fact, he's central in all scripture. And you can't help it once you start studying and learning about Christ that you see that everything really, he's in it all. Jesus is there. He's in it all. And so, so we need to remember that. And there exists, we already said, this great controversy that's going on. Um, and then on number two, a major apostasy going on. And some of it deals with worship. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? True worship versus false worship. Or the mixing of truth and error. If you mix 99% truth and 1% error, is it true? No, it's false. It's false. And then number four, that major apostasy going on, we've been learning about that um, from the Word of God. There is an apostasy that's going on. There is a time going on right now when, when scriptures are being laid aside. I've read websites in churches, of churches, and they will actually tell you we do not go by the word of God. We go by tradition. So when you go there, you know that it's not the word of God that counts. It's tradition, apostasy. Apostasy is a falling away, and that's what's happening right now. Number five, God's faithful end-time commandment-keeping people are going to be the minority. So if you're following the majority, you're probably in trouble. Because you know that's a rule, isn't it? The majority rules. But it's not always what the majority wants. That's good for us. So we need to remember that. The majority will be in the minority. And number six, God will not take us out of tribulation. He's going to go through the trials with us and take us through the tribulation. Remember that. God always will take us through. He took Daniel's friends through. He took Daniel through the lion's den. And so he will take us through whatever tribulation that we have to deal with. So this little horn... I think I got one more. Ultimately, there will be a death decree brought about by this little horn. And so this little horn is the chief antagonist in the great controversy. He's the guy that's causing all the trouble. And so we're going to see that Satan and this little horn, working through this little horn, has endeavored to sever time and law he's endeavoring to hurt our relationship with god because listen every relationship has to have what time if you don't spend time how much of a relationship do you have relationships need time and what the the <clears throat> devil is trying to do is to cause God's people to have less time with God, to spend less time with God, and to have less of a relationship, a weaker relationship, and because without a deep personal relationship with God, guess what's going to happen? We're not going to win in the end, because we won't have the power within us that comes from only the Holy Spirit, only from God, to help us win that battle. Does that make sense? So tonight we're going to talk about this little horn and the fact that can this little horn actually change God's law? And then in our next lesson, we're going to see just how that little horn 
tries to change God's law. But tonight we're going to see how, or we're going to see um, if he can, if he can do that. So let's go. <clears throat> Question number one says, what specifically <clears throat> would the little horn think to change? Times and laws. Times and laws. So I want you to notice that this text doesn't say that it would do it. It says it intends to do it. And in the King James Version, it says it thinks to do it. And I've said to you, have you ever sometimes just, you just knew you did something and then found out that you didn't do it? But you had every intention. You were going to. But this power thinks that it's going to do it. It intends to do this. The question tonight is, can it really do it? And so I want you to look at that note down there. It says, note also that it would think to change not just the law, but the times of the law. And it says, one of the key thoughts that we have noticed already in Daniel is the need to take time with who? With God. And so this little horn is going to attempt to change the times that we spend with God. It's going to attempt to change the system that would help us build that relationship with God. Does it make sense? So let's go to number two. And number two says, how many commandments are in God's law? So tonight we're kind of doing a review of the commandments of God, aren't we? And it's amazing how many people don't even know what those Ten Commandments are. They may know there's ten, but they, they, they can't tell you what they are. So we're going to go over them. Ten Commandments, it says. God has ten of them. And when you think about it, if you look at them in the original language, they're really positives and not negatives. Did you know that? And sometimes I, I, I've wanted to do a sermon on the, the positives instead of the negatives. And because... You know, I mean, think about it. The first commandment. I think that's the next question. What is, what, okay, what's, what's so special about these commandments? Let's go there for it. I'll tell you when we get there. What's so special about these commandments? Written by the finger of God. Think about it. Everything in the Bible was given to us by God through prophets. Except what? Except the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, actually, in reality, um, it's God's character, right? So it's God's character, and if we think that we can actually change the law of God, well, then we would actually change God, right? Did you ever think about that? That would be the end result, that we would actually replace God. Because we already know that God never changes, right? So, so anyway, this little horn power attacks and it attempts to change the one part, the one part of God's word that actually would change God. Now, we know what the power of the little horn would like to do anyway, right? Ezekiel tells us, Isaiah tells us, he wants to be like who? God. He wants to sit in the place of God. And so here this power is thinking that it's going to actually attack in reality God himself. It's pretty bold, isn't it? Can you imagine saying I'm going to get God. I don't like what he's done. I think I can do it better. I think if I were in charge that I could do it better. Can you imagine? I, I, it just boggles my mind to think that a being that was created perfect could have fallen so low. But what I want to tell you is this is what sin does to humanity. This is what sin does to anything that it touches. It destroys it. So, let's go look at the Ten Commandments. But first, here's the fact. If you break one commandment, the Bible says in James that you're guilty of breaking how many of them? 
All of them. All of them. Let's go and look at that text in James chapter 2 and verse 10. James 2 and verse 10. For whoever, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of what? All. Of all. So we can't say that if we see somebody that's just literally breaking God's law and they're being very careless about it, we can't say, man, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm not that person. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like, you remember that prayer in the New Testament? The Bible says if you break it in one, you've broken, them, you've broken all of them. And the truth is, is that all of us are sinners, right? We're all sinners. Um, so if God could have changed the commandments... If God could have changed the commandments, he would not have needed to send Jesus to die on the cross for us. Do you understand that? I'll repeat this again, but I just want you to hear this. We'll talk about it later. But if God could have changed the commandments, he would not have needed to die on the cross, to send his son to die on the cross. And then the cross saves, not the law. I want to remind you of that. The law does not save you. The law points you. It shows you that you need saving. Make sense? It cannot save you. It's like a mirror. It can show you that your face is dirty. But do you pick the mirror up and go, try to clean your face with it? It doesn't work, does it? You need what? Soap and water. And so the law is important, but it doesn't save us. And so you say, but, you know, I can't follow the law. I can't. I, I, I just I don't know how to do that. Let's go to John 1. John 1 and verse 12. And the Bible says it this way. But as many as received him, who would him be? Jesus. Christ. To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. If I trust God, following and obeying the law is going to work out, isn't it? I don't keep the law to be saved. I keep the law because I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, that's why I'm saved. Does that make sense? Okay. So number four. Number four says this. Um, it says, what is the first commandment? What is the first commandment? What is it? No other gods. No other gods. None, it says. God only. That's, that's, that's your God. And anything less than that, or anything, anything beyond that is having another God, right? Um, so this law, this law that we're talking about is actually just what the lesson says. is a transcript of God's character. It's kind of like a resume. God's got a short resume, doesn't he? at least in the Ten Commandments. But it tells everything about him. And it's a, it reveals him. It reveals him for who he is. His law is a reflection of him. And so to change that law would actually be, again, changing or trying to change God. So we're to have no other gods before us. He is our God. He's the one who made us. He's our creator. And number five says, what does the second commandment Prohibit. Yeah. 
bowing down to graven images. You know, it says, you shall make for yourself a, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Now today, we have ways of making all kinds of images, don't we? Carved images. Is there anything wrong with an image of something? As long as you're not worshiping it. Okay? As long as you're not worshiping it. Um, I've had people tell me the same thing about pictures. And I say, well, I don't worship pictures. I use them as illustrations. Because I know that people, of the people sitting right here tonight, 60% of you are visuals. And if you don't show pictures, you don't get your message across many times. Okay? But God's not talking about images in general. He's talking about things that you, you don't fall down and worship anything. Because he is the one that you worship. No one else. Don't bow down, he says. Number six. And it says, what does the third commandment say in Exodus 20 and verse 7? It says, you shall not what? Take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And listen to me, folks. Do you have to cuss to take the name of the Lord in vain? You can take the name of the Lord in vain if you just are doing things and you're not following God. You've taken his name. If, you're, if you claim to be a Christian and you're not doing what God has asked you to do, you're taking God's name in vain. Did you ever think about that? That's something to think about. Something to think about. So, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number seven says, what does the fourth commandment require of people? What does it say there? Remember. remember. And if God says remember, are we supposed to remember? Yes. Remember the Sabbath day, it says. And then it says, what, specific, what specifically are people to keep, or what specifically are people to keep as the Sabbath day? The seventh day, it says. The seventh day. And so, I want you, let's look at that note right there, and I want you to, let's just read it. It says, oh, I'll just skip through it, but I mean, I, 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 there's parts I want to read. It. it says, one day, each week, contemplating who? The creator. the creator. One day each week. And that one day is building a relationship with him. And it says, God asked people to take time to build a relationship with him while people must spend time with God every day in the Bible, studying, praying, daily devotional time. They're to spend, still to spend one day with him, one day, one day. In other words, that one day is intense relationship building with God. It's your time with him. It's your time with him. So it's important, isn't it? Next question says, what commandment did God give to protect the family? Now, did you ever think about this as honoring the family? Or it's just something that kids need to know? You know, hey, kid, watch out. You're dishonoring your parents. Could it even stretch beyond our physical parents? Could it be also about honoring our father? But the point is, is that we're supposed to honor. And today, the one thing that the devil seeks to do is to destroy the family. If he can destroy the family, and there are some families that have been so broken apart... And I don't know about you, but I see it in our school kids and things like that. Because, you know, it's hard if you don't have a father. It's hard if you don't have a mother. It's hard if you don't have both your parents. There's a reason why God gave two parents to a family. It wasn't just to have children. It was to raise them in honor to know God and to know who the creator was. And so if the devil can destroy that family unit... He can destroy society. Don't we see that happening even today? Well, there are more commandments. 
And it says, what, are the stand, what, are, what moral standards does God uphold in the last five? And the first one says, don't murder. That's pretty reasonable, isn't it? Have you turned on your TV lately? Every night there's a murder somewhere. All the time. And the Bible says don't do that. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. We've already talked in our lesson about spiritual adultery, but this is physical adultery. You know, having a relationship with someone who is not your spouse. And then it says, you shall not steal. If the law was done away with, I could steal your card, John, and it wouldn't even be stealing. Right? Okay. And then number uh, letter D says, you shall not bear false witnesses. Oh, brother. We may not steal. We may not commit murder. But what about false witnesses? I can hear some people say, Pastor, you're going to meddling now. But it's a serious thing, God says. Don't bear false witnesses. Don't tell lies. And then, you shall not covet. Man, I sure would like to have that car John's got. Whew, man, just would love to have that. Don't covet, right? Yeah. <laughs> now Doug wants to know what kind of car you got. See? <laughs> And uh, so anyway, but don't covet. And then it says, law and grace. These are the Ten Commandments that we're talking about, law and grace. And it's just amazing that in Daniel 7, there's a prediction that a little horn is going to try to change these laws. It's just amazing to me. And obviously, it would have to be a subtle change. Think about it. If people came along and it was on the nightly news today that, you know, that we're going to change the law of God and we're going to take out this, we're going to take out that, we're going to substitute for this and this and this, you think there'd be an outbreak? Even in an immoral society and a, and a world that's lost its moral compass today, you think there'd be an outbreak, an outcry on this? You think there would be? I think there would be. But, it, yeah, it has to be done just subtly. So people don't really notice it. In other words, over a lot of time, changing things. You know, you might say, well, I remember when my mom telling me that when she was a kid, they did this and this and this. Well, we don't do that anymore. Well, things change, don't they? Has the world changed? Absolutely. So this power is going to think to change God's law. So let's look at it because one of the ways that, that uh, uh, the devil has sought to discredit God is through his law. And he suggests, if you read your lesson, uh, the law's kind of been done away with. Hmm? Have you heard that before? The law's been done away with. And so um, we don't have to worry about sin because there is no law. And, you know, but the truth is, is what does the Bible say? You know, the Bible says we're saved by grace. So if we're saved by grace, I don't need to worry about sin, right? Because God's going to give me grace. God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. And he says it's wicked. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's why we need grace. But what does the Bible say about God's law? What does he say here? Let's go to question number 11. It says, what is sin? 1 John 3 and verse 4. I, th I think that most of you probably know this by heart. But sin is what? Lawlessness. Or the King James would say it's the transgression or the breaking of God's law. So one way that Satan has tried to to destroy God's law is to create this division about law and grace. To create a division that somehow we don't need law because we have grace. And the truth is, is that law and grace go together. You can't separate them. It's impossible. Question 12 says, 
No, oh, here's the one. If there is no law, there is no sin. So if there's no law, I can take your car and there's nothing you can say about it. There's not anything that anybody's got in here I couldn't take. Because there's, if there's no law, I can have it. I just take it. Now, I might have to take it when you're not looking, but I could take it. Right? Because you wouldn't want me to take it, obviously. So I would have to figure out how to do that. But that wouldn't be sinful because there's no law. Right? And if there's no law, there's no sin. And think about this. If there's no sin, we do not need a Savior. I want you to remember that. I want you to let that sink in. No law, no sin. No sin, no need of a Savior. So the next time somebody says to you, uh, you know, the law's been done away with. Really? Oh, well, you got a nice car there. I'm thinking I'm going to take that. Oh, you can't do that. Stealing. No, 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 no. There's, there's no law. Remember? It's about as crazy when we say, make that statement, right? No law, no sin. No sin, no need of a Savior. So the devil wants us to believe that the law somehow has been nailed to the cross. So if the law is nailed to the cross and there's no law, which law is it that points out our sin? Which law is it that points out our sin? What does the Bible say? Paul says, I would not have known sin except through what? The law. You shall not covet. Paul says, I, 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 the reason I knew about covetousness is because of the law. That's how I knew. So, um, is grace an excuse for sin? What does Paul say? He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. King James says, God forbid. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Why? Because grace isn't an excuse for sin, is not it? It's just not. Um, number 14. Number 14. Um... You know, I think I, before I go there, I want to remind you that grace is the reason why we want to keep God's law, right? I mean, if you're driving down the road, you get a speeding ticket. And the, and the, the officer, for most people, and the officer says, <laughs> and the officer says, Hey, John, I'm going to let you go this time. Just keep it in the speed limit. Yes, sir. Would you say, okay, and you get down the road, you drive, you drive down this road here, it's 45, which most people are going 55 now, but you go down 45, and you drive through the whole road, and then you turn around, and you come back and say, now, I've kept the law now. I don't have to do it now. This time I can go as fast as I want down the road because I've already kept it. The officer gave me grace and I did that, but I can do what I want to now, right? That's not what the Bible says, is it? It's not what the Bible says. And so it's because of God's grace that we want to do what God has asked us to do because he, he has relieved us of a death sentence. I'm not going to die because Jesus died for me. And I want to do what he wants me to do. And so I'm going to follow in his footsteps. Number 14 says, what is the purpose of God's law? It gives us a knowledge of sin. And I've already said to you, um, the mirror. You know, you look in the mirror. And you look in the mirror because you want to see, is everything in place? Let's see, yeah, mm -hmm. Let's see that here. That's here. And, uh, oh, where'd that dirt come from? Hmm. Shows you how to get rid of it, doesn't it? But you've got to have soap and water to clean your face. 
So the law is like a mirror, and it reveals to us what our problems are. That's what it does. The law doesn't save us. It helps us to realize I need cleaning up. My life needs cleaning up. I need this cleansing agent that only Jesus can give me. And so the law is like a mirror. Number 15, how only can a Christian be clean? Where does the soap and water come from? It's the blood of Christ. So with his shed blood, his shed blood. And that note says, only through Jesus can people receive cleansing. People are not saved by keeping the law, but by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. So so we're saved by faith, by grace through faith. In fact, here's our next question. How are people saved then? By grace. Through faith. Not of works. You remember the orange tree illustration that I told you about one time? I said, no. Why does an orange tree bear oranges? Because it's an orange tree. It doesn't sit in the ground there and thinking, well, I've got plenty of dirt. I'm connected to the roots. But let's see. Am I supposed to do apples or oranges today? Let's see. Um, mm, oh, oranges, 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 oranges. No, it just bears them at the right time. You know, God has a way of telling an orange tree when it's the right time to bear fruit. And around our house, we have a little kit, a cat. Oh, she's really a kitten herself that's just had, had kittens. And it's amazing to me what she knows how to do. And she's never done it before. Yeah. And let me tell you, if I bother her babies, she's as loving as she better. You bother her babies, mm, she gives you that stink eye. Yeah, she lets you know. How do they know how to do that? Because God has taught them. God has taught them. God teaches fruit trees. They know. It's, it's, it's not that they think, but they, they have all that information in their system. And they, it comes out at the right time. How do the leaves come out before spring? I mean, uh, spring is coming. How does it know that? Well, the heat, all this. But the, it, God has a way, doesn't he? God has a way. So we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, it says. So law keeping and good works, they are the results of loving God. If I love God, I'm going to want to follow him. I'm going to want to trust him. I'm going to want to have that ongoing relationship with him. So that's the way the Bible talks about it in the New Testament. But what about in the Old Testament? Because, you know, there are some people who believe that God saves people in the Old Testament one way, and he saves the people in the New Testament another way. And people believe this, you know. They actually are told this. And so... We want to go and see what the Old Testament teaches us about law keeping and about grace and all this kind of stuff. So let's go there to question number 17. And it says, did God give the Ten Commandments to Israel before or after he redeemed them from Egypt? After. Yeah, see. It says, I bore your own eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey, if you will indeed obey my voice, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So God went in, he brought them out. And I suppose you probably could go in and figure out what that whole time frame was from the time they got to this point to the time they got to the foot of the mountain where it was time to actually receive the law of God. So God saved them before he ever even talked to them about the law. Right? And this is Old Testament. This is Old Testament. 
Okay, number 18. So um, it says, number 18, what is the Old Testament, Old Testament motive for obeying God? What was it? Love God. What did you learn about this scripture? This is the very text that Christ quotes. The greatest commandment, first commandment, love God. Second is likened to it, love your fellow man. So to love God is the same one that Jesus quoted, Matthew 22 and verse 37. And then um, the second, uh, love, your, your, love your neighbor. But so love was the motive for obedience to God in the Old Testament. You know, I can understand if you've never been taught this that you would not necessarily see it because sometimes people will tell me, they'll say, you know, Tom, in the Old Testament, boy, God was hard on some of those people. Well, if you go and read long enough, you probably find out that he wasn't hard on them. He gave them a long time. And everywhere in the Old Testament, when somebody is being destroyed, normally the cup of iniquity is full. And when the cup of iniquity is full, God said, that's it. And it's over. But God usually gives more than sufficient amount of time for that to happen. See, it could have happened uh, when Jonah went to preach. Now, it, their cup of iniquity could have been full if they just said, no, we don't want this. But they didn't say they didn't want it. They said they wanted to walk with God. And so they saved themselves and bought themselves some time. I mean, they did eventually change again. Probably different, different people, different generation. But God has conditions when he gives prophecies sometimes. And he says, you know, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And so here we are um, in the Old Testament. And God says, love the Lord your God. Love him. Follow him. It's Old Testament. And it says in number 19, oh, well, here we are. Let's get your Bibles. John 13 and verse 34. John 13 and verse 34. And the Bible says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another. Love one another. Let's go to Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18. And the Bible says this. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Same thing. Matthew 22, verse 36. And the Bible says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Two tables. Two tables. On hang all the law. And so the Bible says that we're supposed to love one another. 
it's really the only way the society really gets along together, right? Any other way, there's always problems. Well, let's go to number 19. It says, was Old Testament religion a legalistic religion? What does the Bible say here? And I know that most of you probably know Micah. It says, what does the Lord require of you but to, what? Do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. See, obedience springs out of a loving relationship with God. You need this. You will not follow God. And a lot of times when we're stumbling and falling and failing, there's something we're hiding from God, or there's something we want to keep doing that kind of becomes an idol to us, right? We have to trust God. And if we trust him, and we know he wants us to not do whatever it is we're doing, he will give us the power. He will empower us to overcome it. John 14, 15. How many of you know that? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Let's go to... So the next verse in 21, John 14 and verse 21, and it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Woo. What did that say? If you keep my commandments, you're the ones that love me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Love. It's the basis of following Christ. It's the basis of following the commandments of God. And then in chapter 15 and verse 10, it says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So if you keep God's commandments, you're going to abide in his love. That's important. And it says, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus gave us actually an illustration of what we're supposed to do. He lived it out. He came here. He lived it out. And he says, if you follow me, you're going to be okay. Because I'm going to give you the power to do it. We don't have to worry, do we? And when the devil says to you, you know you're not worth anything. You're sorry, good for nothing. Maybe he hasn't told you that yet, then he will. And you can say, get thee behind me, Satan. For I love Jesus. And he's the one who will save me. Because I love him. And that's what we need to remember. Number 20 says... Number 20 says, was the new birth experience also an Old Testament experience? Um, I want us to go there first. Let's take our Bibles and go there. Ezekiel 36. Because this is a very, very powerful verse. Ezekiel 36, and we're going to look at verse 26 and 27. And it says this. Let me get there. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt and ruined the ruined places and planted what was desolate i the lord have spoken it and i will do it thus says the lord i will also let the house of israel inquire of me and do this for them i will increase i'm reading the wrong text am i at the wrong place oh it's 26 and i'm reading 36 37 no wonder i said this does not sound right Okay, scrub that on the tape. Um, I mean the recording. Okay, 
26 and 27. All right. And it says, and you guys are just going to keep on letting me read, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, just, uh, all right. 26. And it says, I'm finding it. I will give you what kind of a heart? A new heart and put my new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and what? Cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. You see, what God is saying is that if you follow me, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to cause you to walk. Do you really want to follow Jesus? Listen, it's all in or all out. It's nothing in between. And the Bible says, if we follow, God says, I will cause you. In other words, God's saying, I'm going to do things for you to help you to walk in my way. You're not going to have to sit there and say, how do we do this, God? Well, you just follow God and he'll cause you. He will cause you to do it. Some translations say he will make you do it. I like the word cause because it doesn't sound like God's going to say, get down there and do that. He's causing us. He's going to, because why, why can he cause us to do that? Because we've asked him to. You see what I'm saying? He's we're, we're, we're being asked by God to do something, and even if we don't know how or when or why, he will cause us to walk in his ways if we're faithful to him. Now, I want you to notice this down at the, between, let's see, yeah, right down where it says God only has one plan. In both Old and New Testament, God always saves people solely by grace, through faith, and never by works. Never by works. Works and law-keeping in both Old and New Testament were always the result of what? A relationship with God and never a means to obtain a relationship. I've had people tell me that God had a way for the Old Testament and a way for the New Testament. And this is what I used to think when they would tell me that. I could imagine myself being in heaven, walking down the streets of gold with Abraham, and talking to Abraham and say, Abraham, how'd you get here? Well, son, let me tell you, we had to follow the the law to a T. If we didn't, we didn't get here. And so we got here by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. And I could say, wow, Lord, and wow, Abraham said, uh, we got here by grace. Whew. I'm sure glad we didn't do what you did. Can you imagine? You know, when we get to heaven, everybody that's there is going to be there because they love God. Their relationship with God. And even those who may not have had a strong relationship with God, if they lived up to all they knew of the Word of God, they're going to be there. You hear that? Because God takes care of His people. He said, if you love me, follow me. And there's not going to be all these different ways of getting to heaven except following Jesus, trusting Him, trusting Him. Number 21 says, does God, his law, or his plan of salvation ever change? God says, I am the Lord, I do not change. And it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, forever. See, God doesn't have to change. And just think about it. As parents, did you ever tell your children some things and then you changed your mind because something happened? Yeah, you did. You know you did. All parents have done this. But with God, when he tells you something, he's not going to come back and say, Now, John, 
I know I told you this, but this is what you got to do now. This is an update. This is an addendum. You just didn't, you know, you didn't see this, but this is what you have to do now. God doesn't do that. He, what he said thousands of years ago is still applied today. It's, it's there. God has one plan, and he doesn't change it. He doesn't change. And three, the purpose of God's law is not to save us, but to show us we need saving. It's to help us understand what we really need in life. And so there are not two gospels, so to speak. Some people think that, well, if you just believe, that's all you got to do. Just believe. But that belief doesn't include action. Just believe. Because God knows my heart. But that's not what the Bible says. We do need to believe, don't we? John 3, 16, very clear about that. But there's another part, and it's called obedience. But obedience doesn't save us either, does it? Our obedience is what really tells us that we have been saved. You see, the Bible says that we are judged according to our works. But the point is that I'm making is that your lifestyle tells whether you've saved or lost. Does that make sense? Your lifestyle says that you love God, or your lifestyle will say that you really don't love God. You don't have that commitment. Make sense? And so you have to have these two together. You have to have them together. Well, question 22 says, are you thankful that God has an eternal and changeless law are you glad for that and are you thankful that he saves us by grace and then gives us power to keep his law through our relationship with him god is so good isn't he and and the more you learn about him the more you say of course maybe some of you grew up knowing all of this, but I'm saying, I'm sitting here thinking, man, I wish I could have known this all my life. I wish I could have known this all my life. But I didn't. And God doesn't hold that against me. He says, you have it now. Come on, let's go. And that's what he wants for all of us. So what we've learned tonight is this. God only has one plan of salvation, both Old and New Testament. It's only one. And secondly, God's law is unchangeable. It never changes. Thirdly, the law does not save. It just shows us how desperately we need God's grace. And we need a Savior. And number four, oh, it wasn't a four. There's a response. You got your envelopes? If it's clear to you from this lesson that God has only one plan of salvation, salvation by grace alone, and that God's law is an eternal and change and is eternal and as changeless as God Himself, put a check in the first box. And then number two, if it's your desire to take a closer look at God's law to see if there is some area in your life that needs Jesus more. Put a check in box two. Our next lesson is how the little horn changed God's law. Play on words because can he change God's law? But we're going to see how. How that they tried. And that's going to be Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. You got your materials. I will see you then. Let's bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. Father, oh, Father, we are so thankful that you love us. So thankful that you are willing to be so long-suffering with us. We ask tonight that you'll continue to guide us and help us to walk faithfully with you and to remember we follow you because we love you. And whatever you ask us to do, Lord, that's what we want to do. 
Give us the strength and the courage to follow in your footsteps and keep us safe until we return in Jesus' name. Amen.